biohacking, performance, mastery, mindset, holistic health. This is a show about getting better every single day. I'm on a mission, guys, to help over a million people get healthy and lose weight. Why? Because when you lose weight and get healthy, you have higher self-esteem. You have more self-confidence. And that person goes out and crushes their goal and starts living the highest version of themselves. And then they have way more impact on the world. All right. What's up, guys? I am super excited for today's guest. I've got Justin Hart. This guy, he's got a, a brand new book out. And it's called Gone Viral, and he's gonna. We're gonna talk about really what went wrong with the pandemic and how it was handled. And what I love about Justin is that he's not a doctor. He's not an anti. You know what? I don't even know if I can say that word. Yeah, I can say it. He's not an anti vac He he's he is his past is a, an executive consultant. He's got more than twenty five years of experience with Fortune five hundred companies. He's the chief data analyst of RationalGround.com. And, you know, he has also worked with everyone from Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, Dr. Scott Atlas, Day, Jay B- B- Bhattacharya. Uh, and one of the most amazing things I think about Justin is he's a father of eight kids. I have two. I don't know how he does it. And he's still in San Diego, California with eight kids. Unbelievable. Justin, welcome to the show, brother. <laughs> Joel, great to be with you today. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a little crazy. I, I, now, all the eight kids are not with me. Some of them are grown and out of the house. So I've just got four of them but yeah you know you're being a californian yourself it's a tough thing to live the state leave the state right very tough i was recently back in california we were just talking i recently moved to idaho just about a year ago i was born and raised 30 39 years in california it's uh, there's a lot of great things about it and when i went back in march of uh, this year and i hadn't been in almost uh, whatever six months i'm like whoa the sunshine here and the tacos are amazing. No wonder right. people come back here because they're paying that sunshine tax. The taco tax, yes, exactly, right? No, it's yeah. tough. It, it's tough. I, I, I've lived in the. I grew up in the Bay Area. Um, my my family goes back three generations. My wife Jenny, her her family goes back to the 1800s here. So yeah, uh, it's it's a tough thing to to vacate. Um, but uh, there's understandable reason why people do it and why you did it. And uh, believe me, we looked at it very strongly here. Well, great yeah. to be with you, Joel. Great to be with you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it was tough. And I was telling you offline, you know, my wife is from San Francisco. And to pull a native San Franciscan out <laughs> of California is very hard. They're very pri- proud of where they where they come from. And they love to tell you where you're from. But um, she she actually was even pushing me. It's time to move, Joel. So um, I give you, uh, man, you have all my respect just because you stuck it out. And uh, you've been fighting out there for a, long, for a while now. So it's great to have you on. And let's get we'll, we'll talk about your book, but, you know, gone viral. And uh, I'm really just curious, man, you know, how did you get involved in this? Like, was there a day that you, I mean, this isn't your normal thing talking about the pandemic, COVID-19 and vaccines, like, right. I mean, kind of to give people maybe your background and then like, was there a day you realized like, okay, I gotta, I gotta step in and do something here. Yeah. You know, like I say in the book, uh, I, I'm not a healthcare expert. Uh, and normally I wouldn't insert myself into someone else's domain, but Joel, they seem to have no problem inserting themselves into my domain my business, my kids' health, my gym, my coffee shop, right? And so when I when I when they did that, I said, "All right, I need to check the math because I can do that. That's my background." And when I did, I said, "Okay, something is ridiculously off here." When Dr. Fauci gets in front of Congress and he says, uh, "One out of every 100 people who get the disease will die," I said, "That's that's not right. That's not the numbers that I see." And it turns out that he didn't know what he was talking about. And so it turns out a lot of these people don't know what they're talking about. And uh, I, I was a consultant at that time. I had been a chief marketing officer and a chief data officer of big tech companies up in L.A. I was commuting back and forth. I told Jenny, my wife, I said, OK, I've just got to I've got to come home and do consulting. That commute is just brutal. And so yeah. here I was in San Diego. I had three fantastic clients at the beginning of 2020. My first one was uh, a, a, a group that was doing golf excursions for baby boomers so like just wait on it and then my next client was the one that was doing uh a an online uh survey and a detailed uh, analysis on how you get your kid into a good college and then my third okay. client was uh, was a group that was doing high-end vacation clubs for families so you can imagine by the time the shutdowns came 
all three of my clients were dead as a doornail, just killed that side of my business. Yeah. So I had some time on my hands and I said, <laughs> what, what can I do? I'll look at this thing. And I'll tell you, Joel, my own experience, uh, it was sort of a side hobby for me too. Uh, in 2018, uh, I uh, was on the beach with my, my wife. We had a great time in Carlsbad. And by the end of the week, we had a little trailer there. It was fantastic. I started feeling really, really sick. Um, and uh, by the weekend, she was calling it man flu. By Monday, she was in the ER with me. And I was in the hospital Whoa. for the next two weeks. I had uh, a staph infection, and I was suffering from septic shock because I had no idea what it was. You know, staph is that natural flora you have on your skin that everyone has. But if it gets into your bloodstream, and somehow it did, we're still not sure, then uh, I, you know, it can really wreak havoc. And it became kind of a, a side hobby for me of virology. In, in fact, I'm like, what is going on? How did this little tiny thing almost kill me? Right. I lost yeah. a lot of weight, but boy, yeah. that was really rough. <laughs> and, and so I, I took it to my task. I said, this is a great sort of concentric moment for my skill set because I, I take the best of data. I take the best of what I know about what affects the human body. And then I took that to apply it to, you know, how do you solve the problem like COVID, right? And, and the, the issue that we faced was people really, really wanted to defend the narrative. So as soon as we started pushing back, the powers that be like Sauron's eye just scanning us and saying, no, you cannot say that. You cannot do that. You know, by the time this thing was, uh, you know, a year and a half in and I had gathered a Battlestar Galactica like of ragtag ships and analysts and activists and experts and moms and dads under this group rational ground we had basically become kind of the go-to people for creating infographics and posters and details uh, but they started shutting us down we had a lot of our folks lose their um, accounts we had a a cadre of folks who came after us in specific ways mm -hmm. uh, I, I was kicked off of twitter i was kicked off of facebook we think by the white house who was colluding with um you know wow. twitter and facebook on that and we're suing them in that regard so uh, that that was kind of the journey but in the end what we tried to do is understand distinctly we're adults we're going to deal with it uh, it became very political as soon as they shut down the first gym, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, they, when they when they start quashing your basic pursuit of happiness, as the founding documents put it, that that really does have political implications. But our kids, Joel, when they started coming after our kids, that's when things started getting really rough, uh, because the risk to our kids is so extraordinarily low, and they bore so many burdens. Um, so a lot of the book talks about that. Uh, it's it, the, the book uh, gone viral, how COVID drove the world insane. It's uh, it's basically built as kind of a, um, a myth buster, right? We take each of the big myths and we tell the stories, we tell the data behind it. And I hope people use it as both a defense and a weapon that they can use. Because, look, those same tactics that they used at COVID will come back again if if it pops up again uh, or if you know some other boogeyman comes on the scene. They want to use those tactics of shutdowns, lockdowns to keep you under thumb. So um, it's devastating. And to the health of our country, it's been extraordinarily devastating. Uh, one stat in particular, Joel, you'll, you'll love this. This is interesting, right? Which is like, we know, we know distinctly that the, the key comorbidities or the key factors that predict whether you're going to have a really bad outcome with COVID or not are obesity and lack of vitamin D. And, and so who's, <laughs> whose idea was it to stick us inside, eat out of the sun, eating takeout for months, <laughs> putting on our, you know, our COVID-19, everyone put that on, and then uh, facing the world after that. It was really, it's a devastating consequence, and the people who um, perpetrated this need to be held accountable because we need to make sure this never happens again. So that's the short story of how I got into this and the, the overview of uh, Rational Ground and the book. Yeah. I, okay. I love that. So many things to unpack. Um, man. Okay. Just kind of start things off. And and by the way, you know, we were talking before offline, like, yeah, you talk about devastating lives. Like if not a lot of people know this, cause I don't talk about it too much on the podcast, but you know, I, I lost my job after 15 years as a first right. responder because right. of some of these tyrannical things. And you outline it in the book so beautifully, just the hypocrisy and in just this, the simple, like, Hey, we knew in June, I think it was June of 2021 that it didn't do anything to transmission the, the, the vax. Right. So why would we mandate a product that we already knew doesn't, doesn't reduce transmission? And yet people like myself and others are getting fired from their jobs. 
And yes. the other thing I would just say too is what I also love about your book, and you do a great job of of, of bringing it back home, and you really emphasize the kids, like you said. L listen, people people want to get political. Um, they they lose their mind in terms of like their own confirmation biases. But when you bring I think things back to the kids, there's some type of level of empathy. I think all of us can agree. Like, yeah, yeah I have two young boys, eight and five, in San Francisco. Yeah, I call it the Mecca of fear that year. <laughs> right. And yeah. um, we were persecuted for being, I mean, really, we were really looked down upon when we were like the only, and I mean the only family that was not wearing a mask outside in the parks. And um, it was it was a very tense situation, I can tell you. Yeah, it, it becomes a, a, a very social contagion more even than the virus. And what's funny is in the book, I talk about how history repeats itself. We had the 1918 Spanish flu where uh, in the Bay Area, 6,000 people were arrested for infringing on mask mandates. Even the mayor of Oakland back then, you know, was a hypocrite. Uh, he got arrested after his infringing his own mandate. All, all sorts of really interesting things. But you can Yeah, go and back. actually, yeah. Justin, talk a little bit about the of history because I think it's important. And you tweeted the other day and I retweeted it, uh, a picture of a newspaper article from the 1918 <laughs> pandemic saying – mask harbor viruses and they're doing worse like they knew this back then like let's not kid ourselves that this is something new and yet we're replaying history so it's to me it's so important that we understand history and i went down my own deep dive reading books such as virus mania and uh, many others because i wanted to learn more about virology and when i saw what they were putting on tv and in the media i was like this is all a sham and nobody believed me and so yeah talk about that yeah, it, it, look, it, back in 1918, they tried a lot of these same measures. They uh, tried shutdowns of, uh, of businesses. They moved barbershops outside. Uh, they tried mask mandates. They tried school quarantines. Uh, but it wasn't, you know, it didn't have quite the fanfare that it did uh, in our national news streaming media today. And, and so a lot of people just ignored it or otherwise. But in these big centers, you know, they had lots of propaganda. You can see the, the big newspaper headlines where all the judges are masked up. And they came to realize very quickly afterwards that it did nothing. The article you're mentioning was a headline in a Santa Barbara newspaper. It said, mask is the chief ally of the flu. People don't know how to take care of their masks. They become a virtual incubator of bacteria, right? But well, we found that out here in our latest pandemic route. Uh, my group uh, was uh, highlighting some fantastic, very brave moms in Florida who took their kids' masks. Because anyone who had seen their kid wear a mask for a day or two goes, eee, this is not right, right? And they took them and sent them to a lab at the University of Florida, and it came back. There was, there was pneumonia. There was uh, Lyme disease. There was, uh, what else did they have? Oh, they had uh, cow herpes, right, from meat eating and everything. It's just, yeah. it's crazy. So... Uh, we, we know that, but we can go back even further, Joel, 400 years ago to the 1600s in Milan, Italy. Now, they suffered from a real pandemic, the plague, which killed one out of every three people. But they had the same issues. Uh, there was an author in the 19th century called uh, Alessandro Mosani, and he wrote this great book that's actually pretty well acclaimed called The Betrothed. And he based it on journals that he had read from the 1600s about the plague. And basically, it's like love in the time of the plague, right? It was following a couple trying to get married in the time of this craziness. And he talks about how at one point, for example, it was presumed or thought that forces outside of the city, not kind to the Milanese, were coming in and purposely spreading the disease, whitewashing the wall with infected water, uh, washing and anointing the pews, as they say, so that it would spread further. Well, a gentleman from one of the journals he, he read, he, he reads this journal about this gentleman who was uh, elderly in a church, and he sits down, but before he sits down, he brushes off the dust on his pew. Someone from the back sees him doing this and says, there, that man, he is anointing the bench. He's anointing the pew. The crowd fell upon him, ripped his hair, took him outside, and he just concludes the moment saying, I do not think he could have survived much longer, right? Yeah. Thinking about our own altercations on planes and parks, and whether it was social distancing or not wearing your mask. I mean, uh, what he said was the virus of the mind infected the people far more than the virus ever did. And I think that's kind of what we've experienced here uh, during this pandemic as well. 100%. Yeah. I mean, it's exactly what, and I'm just curious too, from just, and I know you're not a scientist or a doctor, but just from your research, because something that I found was when we're talking about viral transmission, 
the particles, the viral particles are so, so tiny. Like you can wear like whatever your mask you want and it's not going to do anything. I mean, there's some uh, studies showing the N95 is, can be pretty effective, but overall, like these viral particles will go wherever they want and they'll go through every mask. So it's really just senseless. In, I mean, is that what you kind of learned too? Yeah, you know, one of the key assumptions that was made around this, right, that basically led to all of the panoply of terrible interventions was the thought that people who were asymptomatic, that is people who uh, had the virus and didn't know it were the primary spreaders of this thing because they thought, well, people must be just spitting on people all over the place because it was thought that it was droplets that were containing that that were, you know, spreading this thing. I didn't know if Dr. Fauci, Dr. Birx just thought we spat on each other all day or what. But in the end, we come to find out, no, it's aerosolized. If you have ever walked into a bathroom on you know, a sunny day and the sun's streaming through the light and you see those, you're like, oh, my gosh, all these dust particles. I didn't yeah. even know where it, it's like 10 times smaller than that. Right. So yep. the, no mask is going to do that. Um, they take, and, and the interventions were they had serious ramifications, sometimes financially. Just think, for example, of all the tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions that was spent on plexiglass around the country, around the world, right? And it was thought, well, here, we get, we're just going to put everything into like a bank teller situation, right? And put this barrier between everyone. Well, the, the CDC recommended that for schools. We put them uh, in pools to separate uh, senior citizens who were doing, you know, uh, water exercises. We we put them um, in in people's faces. It was ridiculous, right? A and uh, if you go to Home Depot, even today they still have them up. They they yeah. went to town because they had all the materials right there, right? So they have these big, massive metal mounts with a six foot plexiglass going up between. And it's awful. It's tr and it turns out, as we did studies, that it actually makes things worse. Not necessarily for COVID, but it gives another surface for nasty stuff to fall on. So you have to clean that now too. And so the CDC in March of 2021 quietly dropped that recommendation for schools sure and retail did. without telling anyone really. They did and a lot of quiet. They did a lot of quiet, lot of quiet revisions, things, right? Yeah. And so just think about that incredible waste of money, right? But we now know from the mask mandates for kids that it really has that impact, right? My my own children. I have I have uh, kids from 27 to one year old, and. Uh, my, not, not from the it's a Brady Bunch scenario. So uh, yeah, my, totally. my, my current wife and I, we have three kids, five, three and one. And they were in preschool during this thing or two of them were. And um, it was a crazy scene because the teacher would come up to us uh, profusely apologizing because she she could tell these kids weren't progressing like her class usually would in pre-K. And the reason why is because she says, try teaching your kid how to pronounce the letter H through a mask. You can't do it. And um, now, you know, my sister has a, a master's degree in speech pathology and her kids are growing up. So she's going back to work. She has job security from here to eternity. Speech <laughs> pathologists are going to be in demand all across the country. And that's rough because that that impacts some serious things down the line for our kids. Yeah, 100 percent. I mean, I'm my my youngest was I'm sorry, my oldest was in kindergarten at the time. And um, wow. Yeah, there was so much. And then even when he was getting fed what I would call the truth at home, um, you know, he still had to go back out in society and people were like questioning him. And so he, oh, I think he always felt like, I don't know if he felt this, but it just my guess of having to defend himself. And that's keeps you kids on edge. There's a stress level there as well. You know, yeah. yeah. I'm curious to actually one quick question before we move on to that. Did your research, because what my research led me to, and I don't know if it did for you as well, but in the 1918 pandemic, uh, the Spanish flu, there was a mass vaccination program that had happened just prior to my understanding. And I don't want to go too much in the weeds there, but I'm just curious if you had seen that. And then all of a sudden we had this pandemic of the Spanish flu that was just going around killing people. I just found it fascinating that we had a mass vaccination program the same time here. And we had this viral um, and what a lot of doctors like Gert uh, Van and Bosch would, would say is, hey, you're creating immune escape. And so it seems like possibly what happened back then was happening again. Do you guys know history, right? Learn the history. But that's what I found. I'm just curious. Did you come across that research as well? Yeah, I, I think, you know, one of the phrases we hear is the original antigenic sin, right? And the idea was, well, if we vaccinate people, then, you know, they they won't when, when they encounter the disease, it will have a, a lessened effect. Well, what you don't realize is that the you know the human immune system 
um, has uh, it, you know a, a half life, a shelf life on these things. And when uh, things that are not in its natural over order take over, it can cause some immune complexes, right? So, for example, um, we, we know for kids, this is the other side of the coin, that uh, if they've had COVID and then they get the vaccine, it, it can actually cause some joint pain, some, you know, heaven forbid, heart pain, because, um, you know, the it basically puts the the system on tilt. It says, I've got these antibodies. What are you doing? Yeah. And it starts spreading across the, the body there. And I, I, what we've said, there was a study that came out last week and it showed that um, when you look, when you, when you use these MNRA vaccines, especially the, the booster shots and everything else there, the vaccine efficacy after three months and then going on to 150 days turns what we call negative. That is compared to someone who's not vaccinated, you are more susceptible to get the virus. And, uh, you know, someone said, well, that's just some crockpot report. No, that was, that was produced by Moderna themselves. <laughs> right. And, and so the, the issue is, um, what, what happens is your immune system becomes more susceptible. When you look at there was a report just the other week, we had thought that, oh my gosh, the Omicron variant is so much more virile, right? It's, it's going everywhere. We now know that that's probably not the case. What happened was it was just escaping across the uh, immunity. These viruses want to live. And yeah. so what they'll do is just find what, how do we get around these uh, vaccines? How do we get around this immunity? And that became uh, the, the rallying cry there. So um, it, it, when we have this hubris that somehow we can magically control these things, as, as Dr. Uh, Fauci said in his infamous uh, Cell Magazine article in September 2020, uh, it's time, you know, that he, he wants to bend modernity towards our will, right? And uh, that, that sort of hubris wow. has just saturated our entire policy. Yeah. Also, I'm curious, and because you brought, you made this point about the psychology uh, a couple of times, and we were even talking about, the, unfortunately, the psychology and psychosis that happens to the, our kids. But why do you think, <laughs> other than the media, but why do, or maybe that's the answer, but why do you think, here you and I are talking, and I think like I'm pretty rational, which of course my own ego says that. But I mean, when we just look at the data, you have the data. You're just a guy presenting data. Like, let's just look at the data and be rational and logical. Why are not why are people not seeing this? Like, how come they can't see it? And is there a psychology behind that and why they can't see it? Well, I, I think part of it has to do with uh I read this excerpt from a 1919. Uh, article uh, about the pandemic and they were talking about just the, the failure of the interventions he had masks and otherwise and his point was it was an editorial and they they, they made a great point this was in Iowa they said uh, the American people are perfectly willing to do whatever it takes but they greatly dislike finding out later that it was all for nothing right and, and uh, I think it's it's a the the kindest interpretation I have is that it's really difficult for people to save face in this environment. We all sacrificed so much, right? Our kids, our jobs, our masking, uh, the Zoom calls, staying at home. Uh, I mean, it was, a, it was a lot of sacrificing. And uh, to find out later that it was all for nothing is really tough for people to stomach. They'd rather yeah. just deal with the narrative that was sort of baked to them. And so I think more and more people are going to be converting over, if you will, to team reality as they come to realize. As I put it, the numbers were kind of like this. It was kind of like 20% were where you and I were in team reality, just saying, look, we, we, we know our rights. We know our freedoms. This is just wrong. There was another 20%, the Eric Topples, the, the dings of the world who uh, basically were on team apocalypse, as we call them. And then in between, you had about the 60% of people who were like, look, I... I don't want to get into the fight mm -hmm. and I can understand that feeling. Yeah. Um, but I think one of the things you, you quickly realize is that uh, unless you do fight, they're going to take it away because it, it's not just the tactics they employed here for, for COVID uh, as some of these um, nastier players will say, this was a good test and you guys acquiesced and we know yeah. what we can get away with. Yep. And so if they know they can get away with it, they will. And um, that's unfortunate. Yeah, and I can't agree more than what you said about fighting. Um, you know, I can just tell you on a personal level, just looking at the first responders in California, mm. you know, in San Francisco, many of us lost our jobs and mandates were forced on us. And I can tell you why, because unfortunately, people didn't fight. 
They laid down their sword. They and I get it. I really I get it. I empathize that people had mortgages. They had families to support. They didn't want to lose their job. But man, I'm telling you, if we had fought and just said, I'm not going to do this because it's either my religion or it's just not right. But they would have backed down. And I have proof because if you look at Los Angeles, I have a good friend who's a captain with the Los Angeles Police Department, and I'm in contact with him all the time. And I say, hey, George, how's it going down there? He goes, great. Uh, 2,000 cops put out religious exemptions. Well, LAPD has about 10,000 cops. Do you think <laughs> they're going to lay off 20 other percent of their force? They right. know that's a dumb move, and they can't afford to do it. And so they won't. But yet – in San Francisco, they did. Why? Because there was only like 40 people. And they said, oh, we can, we can, we can survive without that number. And so it's really interesting. We have the same deadly virus, but if the numbers don't work out for us, oh, okay, well, we'll just test and mask you and we'll come up with some solution, right? Yeah, you know, the, the pandemic was also very localized, right? Like here in San Diego, uh, and, and basically, you know, whoever your neighbors were, whoever was kind of in charge or whatever sort of um, panic or rapport took over your town was how everyone reacted Very here in true. San Diego. Yeah. Here on the west side towards the coast where I am in San Diego, uh, it, it, you know, everyone was masked to the hilt. If I went to the grocery store, it was 90 percent masked. If I didn't wear my mask, I'd have people chasing me down the aisles. But if I go like 15 miles inland towards God's country in Poway, uh, it was like uh, maybe 50 percent, sometimes 20 percent. And nobody cared if I didn't wear a mask. Right. And so your experience very much mirrored what other people were, were experiencing there, whether it was your you know, local school board. I mean, literally, I've, I've known people who are on the border of one school district or another. Uh, one set of kids had to vax. The others didn't. It's a it's a it's a nightmare scenario where that consistency really does hurt you. But who knew that your local county authority had so much control over your life, your business and everything else there. So those are those are things we that, you know, and we use in the book. Basically, we have a bunch of templates in the back that you can use for letters to your school board or letters to your county, how to stand up to these things. A lot of stories, too. I wanted these heartbreaking stories in there. And it, it was it, like, I'll, I'll give you one. Uh, I got a text message from a friend. He said, uh, Justin, my, both my parents have passed away now. Uh, one from, uh, but not from COVID, one from an undiagnosed blood disease, the other from an undiagnosed cancer. Mm -hmm. They were too scared to go to the hospital. And uh, really, when we looked at it, that's, that's the devastation that we have there. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it, and you were actually down in San Diego fighting, like you said. I think you were out on the school board and you were kind of like leading the charge down there, right? Yeah. And, and I think, you know, this is, this is the, the difficult thing. You, you know, you have an affinity towards biohacking and everything else there. I, I thought the MRA vaccines were very interesting. Um, yeah. they, had, they had a lot of promise. Uh, I'm a big uh, follower. I, I do some biohacking myself and I, I love the CRISPR technology. And yeah. now I'm sort of looking back on this and saying, okay, we really need to slow our roll because we don't know what are doing. You see right now in Boston University, they created some hybrid super COVID bug or it's still unclear exactly right. what they did, but they didn't report it to the National Institute of Defense. I'm, I'm still waiting. Like I took a poll last night and I said uh, on Twitter, I said, so what will be the cover story for the super bug that's released from Boston University? I said, will it be a uh, Faneuil Hall lobster roll? Will it be a Fenway Park hot dog? That's what I voted a, for. Okay. But yeah, so this, this, it, it really is crazy how we've, we've seen those things pop up and the hubris that we have that somehow we can master all this thing. You quickly realize that's, that's not the case. You know, to, you might as well put your arm to stop the Mississippi River as you would to stop a viral respiratory pathogen. And that's what we've learned. You can't stop it. You just have to go forward. And, yeah. and in the end, the, the main takeaway I want from the book, you know, that people have, I said, look, um, you know, how you reacted during the pandemic is, is one thing that's understandable. There was chaos, uh, but how you behave yeah, and, and you have to understand that your behavior had nothing to do with the ups and downs of the virus and the pandemic itself. But your behavior now will change the course of the world after the pandemic. Great, great point, right? Because not all of us were, you know, I consider myself lucky actually now two years ago that I had some foresight and it was no accident. I just had a different background coming into the pandemic. I had a lot of awareness. And so that led me just to some questions, some things, and a lot of people didn't. And, um, but hopefully after these two years and just kind of seeing, I think I just a lot of hypocrisy really. And just like, that doesn't make sense. Like I, we just talked about the locality, my mom an hour away from San Francisco, completely different. Like you said, people were outside doing Tai Chi and doing things. And, 
nobody was wearing a mask, but in San Francisco, I mean, yeah. people would go across. They would, if you were walking on the street, they would cross the street. They wouldn't even want to be near you. And so, um, you know, like you said, the locality. So, yeah, I mean, hopefully there is some learning lessons. And I think the biggest thing that you mentioned too, is just getting over your own ego being crushed that maybe you made a mistake, but it's okay. We can learn from that and, and move forward. And there's nothing wrong with always learning and evolving. Yeah. And, you know, in society, I tend to, to, to gauge how we're doing based on um, where the government makes you lie. Right. And, and that's difficult stuff. Like, for example, it used to be that if you're and, and this is why I think we're in a difficult position, we're going to have to do some recovery. Um, you know, when, when your kid when, when I grew up and, you know, let's say our vacation got extended, we got a flat tire or something like that. Instead of having to you know, tell that to the school, you just call and say, yeah, my kid's sick. Right. Or, you know, they wanted you, you wanted a day to yourself or and mom wanted to take you somewhere. Just call in. Yeah, he's sick today. Right. Now you have to you have to inversely lie about it, which is if you call in and tell them that you're actually sick, they'll say, oh, that's great. Will you please uh, take a home COVID test tonight and one tomorrow morning and then show us and, and screenshot those. Be sure that they're logged in the national database. It's like, what? Why am I doing that? So you just call and say, um, no, our vacation went over or no, he wants right. a personal day. If your kid is really sick, no one wants to be the parent that comes back with a po positive test because, you know, during the height of this thing, it was it was crazy to get all it was you know, the scarlet letter, man. Yeah, I, I remember um, my 14 year old stepdaughter. She was at school and this was tough because it was a classical Christian private school here in, in California. Uh, but they they folded by the end of, uh, you know, the, the 2021 22 season. They fold like a cheap card table to whatever the county wanted. And so, uh, you know, we get a call and say, well, she's going to have to stay home for 10 days. Well, well, why? Well, she was at a musical performance and someone tested positive, or she was at a, a rehearsal, someone tested positive for COVID. Well, why does she have to stay home for 10 days? Well, she's not vaccinated. Okay, well, can she test to stay? No, they weren't wearing masks, so that's not an option. Okay, well, can you tell me about the kid who got who got tested positive? Is he sick? No, they're fine, but they just tested positive. Well, what else can you tell? I can't tell you. Was he vaccinated? Yes, he was vaccinated, right? So he oh. gets to go back to school. Everyone oh, was yeah. vaccinated. And so it was just like the hypocrisy of the whole thing. She'd sit down uh, at their lunch table, which they're eating lunch outside. Thankfully, in California, that's not a big deal here. But, you know, the lunch attendant would come up and said, um, we're going to need you to sit you know, perpendicular to the to the oh, bench. Oh, my God. Why? Wow. Well, we don't want you facing across from, you know, your fellow students because COVID only will goes in one direction. It's it, it, it was nonsense. And this was a school that was built on the pillars of reason and logic and rhetoric. And we've lost our minds. We lost our ever loving minds on these things. And um, you know, some of the, some of the funnier things that have been fun to market the book are just showing those little screenshots of whether it was, you know, mom concerned about her infant. So she puts a mask on them and cuts little holes for her, the eyes to see through, or whether it was my, one of my favorite ones, they had reopened a theme park in Japan and uh, the two executives of the, the park wanted to show that it was safe to go on the ride. And so they took a, a camera a GoPro on the front of the roller coaster and they were sitting there fully masked. Right. But they encouraged people because of the spread of covid not to scream on the roller coaster. And uh, and so they're sitting there, the whole roller coaster going. <laughs> And uh, the little caption said it all because they said instead of screaming, it said, and I'm sure this translates better in Japanese than it does in English, scream inside your heart. <laughs> and I thought that's an apt analogy. I, there are times I wanted to scream inside my heart over this whole thing anyway. So <laughs> and what a crazy scene. And, and yeah, you, there are th things you just you everyone has that one story like you can't believe. Right. Uh, I, my wife takes my kids to the park now for a year, for a year, they had padlocked the swings I on my kids that. favorite park right Man, yeah i almost forgot yeah yeah and so when the, when they finally opened my wife took our, our kids to the park but there were still mandates to mask all the kids outside and everything else there and you know she got out of the car she didn't mask the kids this lady who didn't work for the park had took it upon herself to be sort of the the good uh karen citizen yes came running out of her car and yelled at my wife to get masks on those kids um, it, we really we broke America during this whole thing, and uh, it's going to be hard to come back to that. I think it's it's tough for people to save face after going through something like that. Yeah, it really is. And what I've 
and I and when I try to talk to people, which is impossible, I think, and I'm I'm like, hey, if you're still wearing a mask right now, like just I just want you to take a step back and just zoom out for a second. But if you are still wearing a mask, like based on your rationale, you should wear a mask for the rest of your life because that's kind of what you're saying. Like COVID is dead. Like these things run their course typically in a two year, one and a half year uh, cycle and it's gone. And that's just, we've seen that from history. And so I'm like, you understand that. Right. But I don't think they can. And, and if, and if their answer to me is, Oh yeah, I'm going to wear a mask for the rest of my life. Well then at least I'm like, Hey, at least you're logically, you know, thinking based on your logic. That makes sense. Let me read you a quick excerpt. This is funny. You know, this, this gets into some of those crazy things. Um, this is from chapter 22 and uh, it, it starts off. Consider, Two scar star-crossed lovers in San Francisco. After this was a great evening- chapter, by the way. Yeah, okay. yes. After an evening of drinking turned into a one-night stand, the slightly embarrassed couple wakes up to find a set of health inspectors at the door. I'm sorry, but you cannot leave this apartment, says the inspector. According to city guidelines, if you had intimate relationships with someone not of your household, you must quarantine for 14 days. And so this one-night stand turns into a fortnight plot with people who barely know each other. Talk about a buzz killer. And, and again, I talk about this might sound like a fiction, but that was the actual law there in San Francisco. Uh, I'm thinking knocked up, but it's a uh, COVID, right? It's like uh, love in a time of COVID. That's my next screenplay. And uh, I, I, it, but you go across the country. It was crazy. They actually would give specific recommendations in Washington state. They said, if you're going to have intimate um, uh, sexual relations with someone, be sure to wear a, a shower curtain maybe between you with holes. Or uh, I mean, a, a, it goes on and on, and you just see this is the most ridiculous thing. California actually came out with uh, a whole set of marketing uh, implementation saying, uh, be sure you put your mask on in between bites, right? <laughs> I just I, I I don't know what to say, and you can't reason with that kind of crazy, and so uh, th- and and that still goes on, right? There are people that still believe that, and so this this book is really like, hey, look, I w- I want to give you the fodder. Uh, stats are one thing, but stories are another. And when you ta- when you take these information to you know that one friend of yours who's in the car, the neighbor you know who who's wearing a mask inside the car, still alone. Yeah. Now those are those are things that I hope you know you can give as a gift, but also just kind of convey to them, hey, look, we need to come back to reality here. Come come back to us, please. Right. You know, on that note, I just want to say people, and I always talk about this, just even on my coaching and stuff, is that we are emotional human beings. We make decisions based on emotion and we then justify it afterwards based on logic oh well i did that because of that and we love to think we're the most logical people but most of our brain the 95 percent of it is the subconscious mind running in the background and it's like the only five percent is the prefrontal cortex that executive decision making and my brother-in-law god bless him in san francisco he's an amazing he's a good person a good human being but he would wear a mask and it would annoy me and i would tell him take that mask off uh and uh he, but the thing was, he wouldn't wear it when I was around. Like, so when we were together, he would never wear it. And I said, how come you don't wear the mask when I'm around? <laughs> and he said, well, you're my brother. You're like, you're my brother-in-law. Like, you're my brother. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. Like, I love you, man. And I'm like, I understand you love me, but based on your, but then I see you leave the house and you put your mask on. I'm like, based on your logic, like I'm telling you right now, I'm at the time I was a first responder. I am around a lot of people. I'm the most dangerous person you, you'll ever meet. Like I'm around a lot of people all the time. And uh, if your rationale is to wear the mask, like you should definitely wear it around me, love or not. But again, people would justify their reasoning when they could wear it and when they wouldn't. And so it's really interesting. And they, and they can't see the connection, Justin. They just couldn't see it. Well, it, it's, a, it's a really interesting scenario too. The, the most masky, the most vaxy, the most um, compliant people have been our kids at college who typically would, you know, be rebellious types, right? Like uh, my parents in the sixties or anything else are going to school probably wouldn't, you know, would have stuck it to the man if they told him to mask up. Right. Yeah. But, but, you know, in a world where um, as Douglas Murray says, you, you post something online and you don't know if you're talking to five people or a million people that has real ramifications, right? The risk of a cancellation right for these kids someone caught you on an instagram not wearing a mask inside uh is far greater than the virtue signaling value that you get out of it right and it's it's the the masking game is really given this entire generation a moment to display their worthiness and we've never had that sort of equivalent before a, a visible outward behavior that 
not only demonstrates one's virtue, but the absence denotes literal death or the intent to murder, right? And uh, this is the this is the world of COVID, where every virtue signal could be had for the price of a face diaper. You can wear it. You can use it to warn others, to berate others, to decorate your Christmas tree. Uh, you know, of, of course, when you <laughs> oh, when you beautiful. Oh, yeah, when, when I'm you apply, put that on my tree this year, a mask. Oh no, yeah. there were there were literal like there, and we'll get into that. But but you you know you apply this public policy across the board, and you create this new dynamic for every human interaction. And just consider, uh, I always bring this up because I just like to be honest. Um, you know, I had a, a, a sociologist or a, a, a really interesting guy last night on our, our book launch uh, on Zoom, and he was telling me how he's doing this research on what happens when you don't have that interaction. Because it's not just like, well, my kids don't, they need to learn how to, how the mouth moves when they say words. But it's more than that. It's like you use that sort of facial recognition to denote tonation and to denote how is a person feeling and to work through that. And Kids I don't know. Will interpret safety off of that too. Yeah. And, and look, is it safe for me to be around you? Yeah. R right. Exactly. I, I remember uh, we had a friend who posted a picture and uh, his child had taken like the target catalog, right. And started taking a felt pen and putting masks on all the faces of kids he saw in the catalog because he said that's the way it should be. Wow. That's devastating. But even think from a from a from a male point of view, just talking about just a, a base element. We're, we're done hopefully with the pandemic, so I can speak to this just openly and honestly. Yeah. You know, when you see uh, a woman, the first thing you you look at is their face. Do I know this person? Um, what do I? What can I? perceive about this person are they attractive what do i see here right and when that isn't available to you you know the, the male goes well let's look at the rest of your body right and it's a terrible terrible situation you've you've put people in to have that sort of i can't have that normal human interaction and it's gonna it's gonna go somewhere else and that's an awful awful situation so uh i think the ramifications of that are very high uh, and we know also from just the myriad of studies we have now that it's it's really damaging health wise. And uh, it, and anyone who puts their kids in an N95 mask is is causing some serious problems. So yeah. that's that's just the masking when you get to that's the vaccinations, the it's, yeah. it goes crazy. So, yeah. OK, I, I'm looking at the time. I know we probably have like another 15 minutes. I've got some I've got two big questions. On that one, and good. then I want to go into some Let lightning round stuff Great. with you. Um, but I do want to ask you this because you're a big data guy. How deadly like, what do the stats really show? How deadly was COVID-19 really? Because the last time I checked, a long time ago, it was like 0.25% or it might have been 0 0.025. But I'm going to let you, you. I know you have the data. What was it? What was the mortality rate? Well, thankfully, I stand on the shoulders of giants. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of those giants that helped me, I remember it was um, April 2020. I had put out numerous articles from March, sticking my neck out there and saying, I think these numbers are all wrong. I think we're making bad data decisions. And I said, what if what if I'm wrong? I remember up at 4 a.m. texting my friends saying, what if I'm wrong? What if this is that deadly apocalypse and I'm just downplaying it? Yep. And then that next day, uh, John Ioannidis, who is the most cited living scientist out of Stanford University, and uh, he wrote an article that this wasn't a once-in-a-lifetime pandemic. This was a once-in-a-lifetime data fiasco. He agreed with me. And uh, he just two days ago, just two days ago, updated uh, the infection fatality rates, and I can't remember the exact numbers, but they were extremely low, extremely low, uh, and that was even pre pre uh, vaccine. Uh, oh, beautiful! For, yeah. yeah, and and the 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 one rule of thumb, and this is the best way to do it rather than numbers, is just to say, is a analogy that he used, and he put this together on a paper that he wrote in March of, in in April of 2020. Uh, if you're under the age of 65, your risk of succumbing to COVID is about the same as your risk of dying on your commute to work every year, okay? Yeah. A and if you're over the age of 65, it's slightly higher. Uh, it's the risk of uh, dying if you were a professional truck driver. And people say, that can't be right. No, it, it's those are the numbers. And I think the the risk that, that we have is that our, our latitude that we gave to all of the infections was so enormous that we, we started just counting everything. So we, we, we got, we had the, one of the first groups that actually looked at death certificates, uh, 86 year old female fall from height, broken femur, diabetes, tested positive for COVID COVID death. Right. Yep. And, and so those sort of things just drove us crazy because you realize that it, it's just not, uh, this is not accurate and it's scaring people when you see those numbers there. 
So that that's the 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 risk is extremely low for the vast majority of people under the age of fifty, even under the age of sixty. Uh, your risk of dying of COVID was less than it was for the flu. That's love that's it. One, so. uh, I love this. Love it. And um, yeah, we know that uh, on hospitals, we're getting paid to have a COVID related death. There's very, a lot of evidence showing that like they got uh, an extra $30,000 for everybody sure. that was a COVID related death. Um, and we also know um, that the what else there was some there was some other stat I was going to quote. Now I just had a, a brain fart. But um, well, let me tell you, on that hospital, let me just a little caveat there. This is the kindest interpretation I have of that. The government shuts down the most profitable parts of your business, the elective surgeries, right? And so if you're a hospital administrator worth your salt, you're like, I've got to keep this business running. How do I do that? And they give you this opportunity to basically say, you can count anyone basically as a COVID death this way. And they go, great, let's do that because I got I to gotta keep in business. Because we now know, looking at the data, there was not really any hospital that was seriously overwhelmed for any significant amount of time. Um, I want to tell you, you put that in the book and I have a, a friend at San Francisco General <laughs> and I asked her, hey, what are the numbers right now? Because the I would get a um, a, a notification from my phone from um, there's an app. Oh right? yeah, and it would say hospitals are overwhelmed and da, 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 or a news article. And I would say, was this true? And she would screenshot the waiting thing. She goes, no, we're completely fine. It's all made up. And then, but again, that was me having inside information. If you look yeah. on the news, which most people do, that's the information they're getting. Yeah, it, it's a rough time. All right, lightning round. What do you got? You guys. Oh, no. Big one question. one last yeah. question because I wanna, I wanna, I wanna ask you. Like, and your book talks about this, but you know, is there hope for us? And <laughs> is there are are we winning? And you know, what can we do to be better prepared? Because again, history repeats itself. Nineteen eighteen, same kind of stuff, and they're just using what I call like the playbook. And I'm sure this is gonna come out again. And I'm and you know, there's a lot of conspiracy theories out there. But, you know, they're talking about uh, more tracking and a lot of uh, other things. And so I'm just wondering, what should people be prepared for and what and how can we be better prepared so that we don't fall into this um, this guise of the, the covid uh, malaise? Well, uh, I have it on good authority that if there is a changing of the guard here in November, that is with the election, uh, that uh, we have a good chance to do some hearings next year, because what we need is transparency. Uh, we need to air this stuff. We need accountability. So right now, for example, Dr. Fauci and the director of uh, the NIH uh, sit on the board that decides grants for all the NIH monies, right? But they also decide policies. So the, the question is, what are the chances of you getting a grant approved if it doesn't adhere to the narrative that they've established, right? Zero to none. And so those sort of things need to change dramatically. And you look at you know what happened in Boston University. I, I don't care what they call it, whether they were enhancing the mice or everything else. Some of that stuff has got to stop because you know someone say, well, it it the uh, the the virus in China came from a wet market, not from not from the lab. I'm like, the lab is literally 900 feet from this wet market. Are you saying that's just a coincidence, right? <laughs> right. And, and so that's why I'm saying, yeah, it'll it's going to show up in some. Uh, some type of hoagie in Fenway Park in, in Boston, and they'll blame yep. it on that. But yep. but so I, I think I'm I'm a glass half full guy. Me I too. think there's there's a chance to to really um curb this. Um, but look, this 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 doesn't help. You know, uh, the the love I have for biohacking in any way, because we we we've, we've made so many so many errors, right? And in fact, it makes me look at that uh, with a, a little eye of, well, what are we going to do here? Because I thought there was fantastic uh, potential for CRISPR. And now I'm like, let's slow our roll because who knows what they'll come up with that, right? So uh, there's a lot of interesting things for, for that arena of interest uh, that I think uh, we'll have to take a look at. But I, I think more importantly, we, just, we need to have a, a national discussion on that. And there needs to be a template that we can take. So, for example, Florida. Uh, you know, they have a law that uh, a sort of patient's bill of rights that if your loved one is dying in the hospital, you have a right to see them. Right. Yeah. Uh, the the people that died alone. Um, we have a story in the book of um, this uh, uh, woman who is mentally uh, disabled and uh, she died alone in that hospital. And I can't I, I still brings me up to tears when I think about that. Yeah. Uh, again and again, we saw that in the death certificates we looked at, Joel. They uh, the the common thing that kept coming up was a really interesting phrase they use on some of these death certificates, especially for Alzheimer patients, which was failure to thrive. 
And uh, wow. the reason for that is the, these people rely on that human touch interaction. When that goes away, they die. And um, yep. we did that. We, we killed these people by allowing that to happen. They showed, I've seen in rat studies and stuff too, if you can take away, if you remove dopamine, they will die, which is dopamine, that wanting, that motivation factor. If you can take that away, people die. And like the rats were dying in like a day or a week. I can't wow. remember what it was. And so yeah. it's no surprise. Um, amazing. Okay, good. I'm a glass half empty, uh, half full kind of guy myself. So let's go. And I think it's a lot of people like you and I taking charge and fighting back too is, is going to be a necessary. And I think you said the good news is a lot of awareness came out of this. I think people are starting to question things more than ever, yes. you know, and I think we just wholeheartedly in the past just accepted like, oh, vaccines are good for us. And now it's like, huh, well, I don't know. Like, let me kind of think about yeah, this again. I, and so I think there's some good things that probably did come out of it. Yeah, I think I think we need to basically we need to welcome people to team reality no matter where they stood, because someone's journey right now is very different than those who are baked in their bones have known this for two years. And the book is really designed for them as well. Yeah. And, and so I, I would say, you know, well, let's welcome them. But there are people that let's say Leanna Wen, who was on CNN daily saying vaccinated people should have no lives. But now she comes out and she says masks were horrible. They damaged my kids. We're like, hey, welcome to team reality. Yeah. But you but you should never, ever have an ounce of influence over policy again. Welcome you to team reality. But there needs to be accountability for the people that cause this. Yeah. Awesome. And I, I hope I know I've, I've, I'm very familiar with her. I don't know if she's faking all this and it's just it's part of an act, but <laughs> I, I hope she is on team reality. I don't know. Uh, all right. Let's, do, let's we'll jump into some lightning round questions and we'll right. wrap things up. I'm curious, man. You know, what are what do you think are some choices that you made? that made you who you are today? Or maybe it was a choice. Uh, I think positivity, that's something that my mom baked into me. Um, I'm always looking for ways that I can get through things. Uh, I think also just uh, being exposed to all sorts of different arts. In a, another life, I was a musical theater guy. In another life, like I said, I did a lot of biohacking. I, I still I, I had a big round of crypto last year. All these things. Yeah. You, you should follow interests where they lie and let your, you know, let your passion sort of spread that way. Uh, I, I became uh, a generalist in, in some definitions, but uh, I, my mom taught me how to dive deep on everything. I remember uh, I had a website one time. I, I think I had a company called uh, Overnight Anything. And the idea was I will absolutely learn anything and I will do it overnight. I'll become an expert in it and tried to do that very quickly. Uh, I had, a, I had a, one of my license plates on my old cars was Alt Tab. And those of you who uh, have a PC might know that's the, the key we use for multitasking. So yeah. uh, I, multitasking can be uh, very detrimental. I've, I've gotten a little better. I've got my little my 25 minute timer here that I put off, you know, and, and nice. that's how I do my tasks all the time. But um, I, I still I still am very passionate about being passionate about so many things. That's I, I think what's good. I love that. Uh, I've interviewed James Altucher. Are you familiar with him? You, I think, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. You got. You would. You would get. You guys would. I think mesh really well. It's some That's of the. Cool. I think some of the same ideas that he has. Uh, I'm curious. Uh, you know, is there anybody that that you follow? I mean, you have such great insight and and just what you're bringing out into the world. And I'm just. Is there anybody that inspires you or that you follow? Oh, that's a great question. You know, uh, with some of my great, uh, the, the people that I read, uh, Mark Stein, uh, Douglas Murray, uh, these are people who are super articulate. If you, there, there are certain books where I go back to again and again. Um, I would say if you get a chance, uh, go read Mark Stein's America Alone. Um, one of the big problems, and this is actually, we, we've formed a super PAC um, that's called Posterity PAC, and it's all about trying to use political action to take care of some of the stuff from happening with COVID, but it's also to encourage people to have kids. Uh, I have eight, as you know, uh, but I'm telling you um, the world is running out of people and the implications are massive. They are huge. No one sees this coming, uh, but it will implode uh, a good portion of the Western world unless we turn things around. Um, you look at Japan, which is, which is in a death spiral. Even China is going to become much more older and weaker then it will become powerful. Russia is, you know, they're really nothing to fear. They're going to be just imploding soon because they have no kids to speak of, and then they have AIDS killing them at the other end. Um, wow. the, so that when, when, you know, when you, why, why is it, for example, that uh, most of the world finance tech and everything speaks the language of a small set of islands off the Northwest coast of Europe. Right. And it's because England was the first to conquer infant mortality. Right. 
because they you know, wa- wash our hands be- from the cadavers before we give birth to these kids, right? And the, so by, by the mid-century, by mid-19th century, by the 1850s, the median age in the city of London was 15 years old. And so the queen had all of this youth to send all across the world. And before long, the, the sun never set on the queen's kingdom, as they say, right? India, Australia, it went across the world because they had all these young men. The average age here in the United States is something like 38. The average age over in Europe is even older. Uh, Italy, uh, Italians will have no aunts, uncles, uh, or, or cousins by the, by, by the end of the century. And you look at something like Yemen, which will have a population as big as Russia. And the problem is that you have the countries that have the median uh, death, you know, age rate of about 15 years old are the ones who really don't have, um, let's say, the best relationship with the tenants of Western society. And so we're going to have some problems. That's um, one of the things I'm looking at. Wow. Interesting stuff. Last two questions. We'll wrap it up. Any rituals, hacks, practices that you do on a regular basis? Some people do gratitude journaling. I'm curious, like what, what's a guy like you do? Uh, I just, I love my kids play with them. Uh, I just have a great time. Uh, we have different r- patterns. I've got like this Kiwi co box that comes every month where we put together some, I know that one. Yeah. It's yeah. great. We do just little routines like that. My routines change every now and then I try to get back on the bandwagon. Um, I used to be uh, a getting things done guy, right? And did a lot of things from uh, David Allen. Uh, I think uh, the other routines, though, uh, it's just try try to get into a routine with your wife where you spend a lot of time with her. That's the key thing. Get married, have kids, spend time with them. That's the routine. Dude, that is – nobody said that on my podcast, and that is – such a great suggestion. And it was something that, I mean, I know from my wife and I, you know, you go through evolutions and you go through different time periods and I have, I'm growing a business and doing all these things. And I'm like, we need to schedule time. Like every Friday, there needs to be a block time because if we don't, it just doesn't happen. And right. um, it's so great. I love that you said that. What a great recommendation. Uh, Justin, last but not least, where can people find you? At, where are you most at? Where can they go and get the book? Well, you can go get the book uh, quick and easy way. It's on, on, on Amazon, but if you go to goneviralbook.com, goneviralbook.com will just take you right there. Um, and you can get the Kindle version, the audio book, the, the hardback, love to have that. And uh, you can find us, um, you can find me on Twitter at Justin underscore Hart. I've got a great Substack. That's where I put most of my stuff there called covidreason.substack.com. Uh, that's a great resource there. But yeah, go grab the book, goneviralbook.com. Uh, sorry, Gone Viral Book. Oh, you got the let, me, let me change that. I, li- I like that real-time action, though. That's pretty cool, Joe. Trying to do it on the fly for you, brother. That's good. No, uh, I book. think um, this is going to be quite the ride over the next little bit. I This was the hardest thing I've ever done professionally. I honestly thought it would be a, a cinch because I, I've had you know so much writing. I, I've never been more embarrassed by uh, how long it took me to do this, how many times the editor said this is unpublishable, um, but just stick with it, um, reach for that, you know, uh, and here's the main thing I would say, uh, there were times, like I said, I thought my head was going to get chopped off when I stuck my neck out like this stuff, but it's been incredibly rewarded. This is trajectory. I never projected for myself. Uh, I would say, go out there and stick your neck out in something. Oh my God. I love that. And I can totally relate. I, there were times when I was living in fear and I, and I didn't know what was going to happen. And I was worried what, how I was going to be judged and how I was going to be looked at. And you know what, at the end of the day, I've only, not only has the faith made me better, but I've connected with the people that I was truly, I think, meant to connect with people like yourself and others. And, um, when you connect, I think with that vibration, if you believe in that or whatever, you just start to connect with more and more people that you align with. And you, you are so right. I love what a great piece of advice. I love that. I'm going to come to you for some weight loss tips too, because, oh boy, (laughs) I'm still taking off that COVID-19. So, I got you, brother. Thank right. you so much Thanks. for being on the show. I appreciate Thanks. you. Great to be with you.